Hi Cheryl, how are you? Thanks very much for making the time. Um, I'm speaking to you from the land of the Gadigal people, the Aura Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elders past and present. We run a series of town hall events on matters of national interest and things that people will be voting on in relation to the federal election. Essentially our purpose is um, to increase awareness of these sorts of issues. There's a real disconnect between what we as voters are asking for and what we're getting from um, federal representatives. So that's our kind of angle. We're trying to promote the causes of democracy and accountability and getting um, some integrity in Parliament as well. The idea behind this interview is to sort of build a little bit on our recent town hall. We held a town hall on the issue of climate action in Australia, what's next for Australia. Everybody knows that it's a political hot potato and nothing really happens um, at the political level, but um, we're determined to try to <laughs> push that along somehow. And one issue that's emerging as quite interesting is this connection between climate change um, being treated as a national security issue, which is certainly the case in the US and in the UK and parts of Europe. Um, it doesn't seem to have got through to people here that it's that serious and that perhaps we need to be looking at that um, from a national security perspective. And in conservative voting areas, we think that that might be something that resonates with people. Um, so that's why we're really grateful to have this chat with you today. We've had this NATO summit this week. Um, I'd be quite keen to get you to just start off by um, giving us a bit of an introduction about yourself. Um, I know that you've been the former director for uh, mo mobilisation and preparedness at the Ministry of Defence in Australia. Um, but if you could let us know a little bit about yourself and your experience, that would be that would be much appreciated. Sure. So hello and, and thanks for the invite to uh, talk to you today. Uh, and I'm coming um, to you today from the Palawa land in northwestern Tasmania and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So a bit about my background first. I spent 30 years with the Australian Department of Defence, the first 15 as an army intelligence officer, which is where I first became interested in in climate and the environment because it's an utterly critical part of analysis of defence strategy and operations. After 15 years with Army, I became a reservist and moved full-time to the uh, civil service with the Australian Department of Defence. I've had a number of jobs across the capability part of defence in operations and also more latterly in preparedness and mobilisation. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been leading, or for the last 10 years when I was in defence, I was leading um, defence's work on climate change and energy sustainability, first through a major study, which we look to understand the risks. Uh, secondly, through a global change in energy sustainability initiative, which ran from 2013 to about 2015, when we then set up an office of the Defence Climate and Security Advisor who was working for me. So I've had a, a long experience, relatively, with looking at climate security issues in defence. Yeah, a no, lot, lot of experience there. We've just had the G7 and NATO making pledges um, to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions from military activities. Um, in a way, the, the caveat is, is that it's in a way that doesn't impact personnel safety or effectiveness of their operations. Um, and in addition, a new report on world climate and security has been published by the International Military Council on Climate and Security, which states that climate change presents a clear and present danger to the world's collective security, um, which sounds pretty scary. Uh, can you elaborate on why climate change poses global security risks um, and what particular national security risks we're facing here in Australia? Well, it is a, it is a pretty a scary topic. It certainly kept me awake at night when I was looking at it. And perhaps to get a sense of, of where this can lead, um, I'll just share a story of one of the uh, war games that I was engaged with in defence. And this was led by the United Kingdom, who, who had a long leadership internationally on climate and security. And they were travelling the world with a, a global war game set in 2050. And the war game that I participated in in Australia ended with India launching a nuclear strike on China. And how we got there in the war game was one of these uh, causal chains, so beloved of intelligence analysts, but it began with climate change because the nuclear strike was in response to China diverting the waters of the Tibetan plateau away from India and towards China. And in the war game, it was doing so because its people were starving. 
and didn't have access to food and water. But that meant that now India was starving and it didn't have access to food and water. And that really is the sort of ultimate end game on type yeah. of risk that climate insecurity causes. Not only is an existential risk to humanity, if the earth tips into to hot house earth conditions, humans may struggle to, to survive. But it's also what we have called insecurity a, a risk amplifier. It makes all other risks worse. So while you may have, for many years, insecurity, um, nuclear war was the worst risk. So not only does climate change make conflict worse, an existential threat itself, but it also potentially has the es chance to escalate into a, a nuclear conflict. Which is pretty terrifying. Um, Which is and pretty terrifying. Yeah, it is terrifying. And, uh, and this idea of um, displacement of people, um, mass displacement of people is something that is clearly a fear for, for many countries um, and something that I just don't think people are thinking about enough. Um, we've obviously got our own issues here in Australia with how we how we deal with people trying to come to Australia. It's a very hot topic still at the moment. Um, yeah, and even just thinking back to the bushfires last year and how the, it, uh, you know, the Australian Navy was involved in um, collecting people off beaches because they were, they were running into the sea basically to escape the bushfires and, and those sorts of things as well. So it's, um, yeah, the, the, the idea of a, of a conflict escalating between India and China or, or between China and anyone really is pretty alarming. Um, okay, well, in your view, is the Australian federal government um, and the Department of Defence engaging adequately with the G7 and NATO and the International Military Council on climate and security, or are they responding at all appropriately to these global security risks? So my, my experience in defence, and it's both in the, the decade sort of 2010 to 2020 that I was, was leading work, but also I think I've kept in contact the, the last sort of year and a half. Our Department of Defence, particularly the military side, are really um, trying to do the best they can in, in our political environment to understand these risks and act on them. And while the, the security environment ebbs and flows, so at some point in time, America was leading on this. There was a period under Trump when they sort of stepped back. They're now back in with, with uh, um, a bang, if you like. They, they really step up and doing some amazingly interesting uh, work in the nexus between environmental and, and national security because the, those things are really closely connected now. Australian defence, it's, it's, it's sort of a glass half full. Uh, many things have been done. We've actually, on the energy piece, um, with regards to our, our base energy, looked at where it's uh, sensible to use uh, backup renewable power generation rather than grid power generation. And that's that's not to the greenies, it's just it made sense um, with f fuel security issues to have a, a backup system that was different from our, our main system. We are looking at also um, alternate fuels. The Navy has taken the leadership there. And when the United States Great Green Fleet came out to visit Australia, we'd actually tested as they had done using uh, hybrid um, fuels rather than uh, fossil fuels in their, in their both helicopters and um, um, ships. So there's, there's options there for defence and we are exploring them. Um, also, the Army recently is uh, starting to look at a hybrid Bushmaster. There's a little bit of funding to see whether it's technically possible. So that's a potential win-win for Australian uh, industry as well as Australian security. We've done a lot of education and we initially were doing some great work across government. Defence was leading the climate ready scenarios for the Secretary's group on climate change. But then it, as the political environment is really hardened to really quite hard opposing binary views, the ability of the Department of Defence to keep the momentum going became quite tough. And uh, unfortunately, we were directed to have nothing to do with the international, I was directed to have nothing to do with the International Military Council on Climate and Security, which is really tragic because one of the, the critical things is uh, politics is politics, but that should not uh, interfere with understanding risk. And that's partly why we formed the, the new Australian Security Leaders Climate Group is because this needs to be bipartisan. Security has always been a bipartisan issue in Australia, and rightly so, and that's why the, the UK has made such substantial advances on climate change. It's 
um, not uh, the hard political potato that it is in Australia. So it needs to be a place where all voices can come together. Um, so it's not just the environmental security, it's national security, food and health security experts, infrastructure and energy security experts need to be together as part of the solution. Um, what I see in Australia is we tend to try and tackle problems in silos rather than have a, a much, much broader debate about climate and security. Yeah, and it sounds like the Ministry of Defence and other you know, departments in government are having the same sort of issues that the corporate world has when it comes to this problem. It's there's no there's not enough leadership from from the government, but all of these corporations and, and departments are doing what they can <laughs> behind the scenes and, and trying to get on with the job that needs to be done. Um, you know, involving experts specifically, listening to experts and following advice. Um, you know, one thing we've seen over the COVID pandemic is the government listening to experts and actually following expert advice and just getting on with what needs to be done. Um, but we're not seeing that in the climate space. It really is extremely alarming that something so important is not almost not talked about in the political space as if it's not an issue when it's almost the most important issue or, or one of the most important issues. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the Australian Leaders Group that you're part of? Because that sounds pretty interesting as well. Yeah, so a group of us who um, include ex-Chief um, of Defence Force and ex-Vice Chief of Air Force, who have been uh, around this issue for a, a number of years, have have decided to, to add our voices to the, the conversation. So we've, we've looked at there's a, there's a health expert group, there's the Emergency Leaders Climate Group, there are Farmers for Climate Action, and we just felt that there needs to be a, a complete and comprehensive uh, discussion in Australia. And we also feel that there's some useful skills in the military that are helpful in, in unpacking climate change because it tends to be really hard for the operators, if you like, those who are normally dealing in the day-to-day, to, -day, to get to a grip of climate change because it's a long-term thing uh, while impacts are happening now and we need to act now in order to turn the ship in time. Grappling with the, the China example I gave you earlier, which is, you know, it's not happening tomorrow. It might happen in 10 years or 20 years or 50 years. So grappling with some of those longer term pathways to, to conflict or longer term pathways to catastrophe is something that the, the military is used to. We, we do plan in long, we plan in, in uh, years and decades rather than, than sort of uh, months and, and years. And also we're very accomplished in, in the intelligence world of, dealing with futures where you're having incomplete sets of data. And I think it's a lot of quite natural inclination to want everything understood before we act. But that's not going to happen on climate change. And it doesn't happen in military operations as well. You never know exactly everything about the adversary. And so in the military intelligence, quite different from science, you tend to, to go with what you've got at the time. You don't delay the decision because that's possibly the, the very worst thing you can do. And in climate change, again and again, the data is coming in, it's much more effective to act early and act at the, the start of a, a series of events rather than the, the end of them. And just for an example, if I would contrast the, the cost of fighting a war with China, well, defence budgets, uh, what is it, uh, 44 billion a year, and the, the war would be a bit more expensive than that, versus the cost of uh, investing in uh, water security for the Asia Pacific region. So one of the things we're not having a conversation about is, is really where's the best point of intervention on climate change? So if we look at a, a really worst case endpoint, which is major, major war between powers over resources, it's India, China or America, China, um, equally horrific. And you look at then the, the mitigation of risk right at the start of the chain. If you mitigate the risk in energy transformation now, which also offers opportunity for win-win-win for Australian businesses, because we are quite fortunate geographically to have access to critical minerals in the renewable energy supply chain and we have some world leading research. You mitigate every other risk so by changing the the energy mix you help mitigate against the secondary risk of of climate change impacts affecting food and water and and other ecosystems which further helps against the issue of migration, which you mentioned before, which can happen with societies that can't subsist where they originally resided because their livelihoods are gone or their land's gone or their food's gone or their water's gone. 
which then also assists against the cost of migrating those people or, or resettling them or the conflicts that might arise because of them. So the, the earliest in the chain that you can take action, the better. And the example I was giving before, it's very costly to, to sort of fight a war. It's less costly to um, intervene after a disaster. For example, you know, just think the 44 billion for defence budget annually. The cost of um, Australia's aid to Vanuatu after Cyclone Pam was uh, 67 million. So that was a, a combination of um, uh, foreign aid and defence, $17 million in defence operating costs. But then the cost of supporting Vanuatu's resilience, so we don't need to respond to a disaster because they're capable of, of coping themselves. We have invested a 400 million uh, across the whole Pacific for uh, climate and disaster resilience and, and low carbon energy transmission. So you see, as you go across this, it becomes much, much cheaper to act earlier. And this is one of also the key things coming from the uh, NATO and American and International Military Council on Climate and Security reports and work. And also reiterated in the UN is the need for anticipatory action. It's the need not to wait till the problem's in your face, but to uh, see where the, the trajectory is going and take action early to avoid the catastrophic risks downstream. Yeah, and, and, and not be thinking in terms of political cycles, which are only a few years long. Is there, is there a sort of dialogue happening between organisations like yours and you know, the Ministry of Defence and other departments and the government, is, is there some sort of plan happening behind the scenes that we're not aware of? Or is there funding coming down the track for these things or is it just not happening? And is that something that we need to get a bit more alarmed about? So I think let's, it's, it's one of these, it's always a glass half full, glass half empty um, situation, I think, in, in Australia. And so there are good things happening, but they're happening in little silos and little pockets and they're not really joined up. For example, there's the Bushmaster funding to, to invest in, let's see if we can have one of our most successful uh, vehicles uh, transition to a, to a hybrid vehicle. There's also quite a substantial investment in uh, critical minerals and supply chains, which will ultimately um, support the transition to renewables, but it's not called, we're investing it for that reason, where the investment is going into for supply chain surety and uh, resilience. So a lot of the action has to hide itself under a different name. And what that prevents is a, is a real sensible decision of where the, the best investment for the Australian taxpayer dollar is. It's because the, the departments have to squirrel climate change uh, investment or initiatives away under different names like resilience building or, or operational energy security or um, regional health initiatives. And thus it really doesn't get to the a problem and as, as you probably had in the previous economic discussion that ultimately climate change reduces access to resources so it fundamentally does to human societies it, it impacts environmental systems and along with other things such as global population growth and uh, sort of unsustainable consumption the resources now are sort of under more and more pressure which means that uh, every year we delay action on climate change, there's less pie of resources to go around. If we think of the cost of, of COVID-19, which is substantial costs on economies, but also substantial costs on societies and groups of people to, to cope with that. So coming out of COVID, we're just a little bit less capable of coping for, for the next major disaster or the, the next major economic shock to Australia, which could be uh, carbon tax bar uh, barriers, um, which is certainly something to, to talk about. It could be another major flood or bushfire season. And so there's there's just this... Or a pandemic, another pandemic. <laughs> or, another pand or it could be a, 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 a biological, um, it could be a disease of wheat, or it could be a, a failure of crops or water systems. Or And, and already mm. in Australia, there are major failures of ecosystems. Um, there's major failures, failures of the, the southern kelp. That ecosystem is very vulnerable. And it's also an mm. amazing ecosystem as a solution to, to global food issues because it's a, a great uh, nutritionist food. And also some mm. of the, the other kelp, not the, not the threatened one, is potential solution to methane emissions in, in land use. So there's everything. While the, while the steps are simple, climate change impacts resources, impacts societies and economies, and then tips over to security and, and fragility risk. 
each each level and and each location is unpicks a slightly different way, and it can become very complicated. So there's some great initiatives uh, now also globally, which I think offer a lot of hope. And it's using using the powers of some of our modern technologies in in big data and machine machine learning and uh, big data analytics, and also the ability to network everyone. Like you don't have to, you know, I congratulate. Uh, your organisation for, for having a conversation, bringing people together, but you don't have to wait four years and have one election to discuss issues now. And at local levels, there's much more participatory engagement in uh, civic decision making. Melbourne, for example, has had a fabulous uh, piece of work looking at regener regenerative Melbourne futures, where uh, several hundreds of Melbourne locals have participated in shaping their, their city's vision for the future. So technologies like we're on today on Zoom allow us to have, have much more far-reaching conversations between people and government um, and not just to, you know, have election. This is the real flawed bit of democracy. It's sort of there's now one decision point every four years on one thing. We're actually, as you identified earlier, Kath, 75% uh, of Australians want action on climate change and yet somehow the political environment is such that governments feel they can't take that, even if they want to, uh, governments feel they can't necessarily take that action because the electorate doesn't reward them from it. But the, we know the electorate actually does want them to take that action. It's just other policies or other issues uh, have been stronger at the, at the time people are voting. Yeah, or minor parties in the coalition who have a particular position on things and prevent the government from doing what it might otherwise do. Um, I mean, it's it, it, my understanding from the report, I haven't read the whole report that was released this week, but it does talk about the compounding impacts of different uh, crises coming together and how that weakens countries' abilities to respond to things like climate change. COVID pandemic is an obvious example. Um, and completely agree with you that the longer we delay action, the more complicated the problem gets. And, you know, humanity is very good at fixing problems when it puts its mind to it. But the problem we're having in Australia is there's not enough focus, I don't think, on, on how to fix it politically, but it's it's definitely reassuring to know that there's lots of organisations working very hard on this, and not just within Australia but and, and in different countries, but coordinating internationally. And that's one of the strengths that I see uh, about an organisation like NATO um, and the G7 and other international organisations is that they're able to connect experts and um and people around the world who want to achieve the same outcomes and, and are able to put their minds to how to fix these problems and, and get on with doing that and finding solutions rather than getting caught up in the political ramifications of what's going on in, in a country like Australia. Um, so that's really encouraging. And I guess the next question that I've got sort of ties into that, and it's about what, what are the global opportunities to climate-proof international security and take advantage of the renewed leadership from the United States um, now that we've got President Biden at the helm um, to build on this climate security momentum from the EU and from NATO. And what, what does that look like from a global perspective in your view? So what's I think really encouraging is the, the, the when America and the UK were first looking, it was very much through a national security lens but that position shifted uh, quite recently, and it's now, I think, a much broader uh, look at security, including human security, which comes very strongly from the UN. But you can see entering now the, the NATO and the American language in, in particular. And uh, for those uh, inner city barista uh, sipping, latte sipping uh, work people, there's no one less woke than uh, Lloyd Austin the, the, the third, the uh, head of the American Department of Defense. He's, if you listen to him at the Biden Climate Leaders Summit, he's talking the language of um, human security and national security. So I think it's important to not just focus on the national security. So I think that's one of the really important things because national security tends to lead to fighting nations. In many ways, it's counterproductive. And there was a lot of fear earlier when militaries became engaged in climate change that this would somehow make it a security debate. But actually, it's it's gone, it's shifted. And, and I think the, the NATO work is is part of that shift. And it just, re, it just realizes that militaries need to understand where and what the drivers of conflict are and where climate change intersects with those drivers. So there's a lot of risk assessments now being done globally to understand where potential hotspots might arise. 
And so global aid can then be prioritised um, into those spaces or peacekeeping can prioritise into those spaces and actually prevent the conflict before it started. Because as we've seen with, with cases like Syria and the Middle East, once you have a condition of conflict, that can also feed terrorism, which is destabilising more broadly globally. It also feeds crime, which is, again, is destabilising more broadly globally. So one of the most encouraging things is the investment in, in risk analysis and early warning, so that rather than waiting for the conflict to become big, nasty and difficult to deal with, um, militaries can be employed earlier in terms of uh, capacity building. So they can be preventative as well. And, and our army is, and military generally is doing some quite good things in the Pacific with Pacific Island nations in order to, to make them more resilient. So we shouldn't forget that actually we've been doing this for a while. Um, the capacity building is a really important piece. Militaries are also big users of energy, particularly American, which is obviously the, the biggest uh, biggest military or them. Right. Not not by uh, numbers, but by by dollars, which it tends to reflect consumption. And so, if militaries can move off um, fossil fuels w where they can, that also sort of contributes and demonstrates leadership. And there's there's big money in this as well, as you viewers probably appreciate. The military industrial concept has quite a lot of access to science and technology, so there can be spin offs out of military uh, work that are useful. Uh, in, in other circumstances. And is one of the pieces was uh, um, some of the American military's use on, on uh, hybrid fuels and, and um, electrical systems um, for military uh, bases um, can be then switched across into a commercial sector and developed. Yeah, I mean, what, so one of the concerns that's been raised with me from um, people who are active in the climate sort of activism space is, is the concern that because the militaries around the world are very big users of fossil fuels they're some of the biggest users I think the American military on its own is sort of ranked like 47th in the world as big as a country in terms of its um, its use of fossil fuels and a little bit of a concern that the, mil the, the focus of militaries on on treating climate change as a national security issue is that there's, you know, they've got to think about how they're going to address their own <laughs> carbon footprints as well. And um, just bearing in mind that obviously the, the, the technology and the use of, of new fuels and um, engineering systems, propulsion systems, that sort of thing for transport um, is really interesting. And, and because they are such big users of that, they probably are, you know, at the forefront of helping to develop some of those technologies as well. And Australia is very focused, as you know, on finding technological solutions to carbon emissions rather than um, just stopping emitting carbon. So, yeah, and it's it's, a, it's really interesting. Well, I think we're just about out of time, but I could talk to you for a lot longer. <laughs> well, I really really mentioned one of those opportunities. I think it's useful to uh, focus on opportunity rather than, than risk uh, that militaries have. And, and obviously in militaries, there's an emerging um, reliance on space and cyber for military capability. So there's a natural shift away from, you know, World War II was the fossil fuels war because it, it, it um, fueled vehicles and ships and planes. The next war may well be fought in, in cyberspace and space. And interestingly, that is not a technology, not a, not a domain of, of warfare dominated by fossil fuels because the, the cybers tend to be dominated by electrical, um, you know, uh, ICT infrastructure, which can be electrified. And also uh, space is not necessarily space where fossil fuels are. It's actually got a strong investment in, in solar. So some of the technologies there looking at improved space. And Australia, if you have a look, um, it's quite interesting. So where government is actually moving uh, quite um, strongly towards uh, the use of, of renewables or new energy systems. And it's in space and it's in cyberspace uh, and in defense. So it's one of the, the safe areas for government to move. So I think you're right in the, the security angle is something where um, conversations and better understanding can sort of help add to that momentum that I'm, I'm already seeing is there. Yeah, no, well, look, I'm really grateful for your time today, Cheryl, and I could talk to you for a lot longer because I do find this topic very interesting. Um, and perhaps we'll find an opportunity to talk again at some point, and maybe the, we're, we're trying to organise a number of panels, as, as you know, and if, if at any time we manage to get one organised um, that we can invite you along to, we'd, we'd love to do that, if that's something you're interested in. 
Um, but we're really grateful for your time and hope to stay in touch. Um, we'll be following your work with interest and um, I'm going to make time to read that report in, in full if I can. Um, it's not too long, I don't think. So I'll try and get my head around some more of the details because I do think it's a really interesting issue for Wentworth and voters here are, are going to hopefully pick up on that and um, we'll start to try to ask some questions of our federal MP about, you know, what his response is to it as well. Thanks very much. If you want some of the Australian Security Leaders Climate Group to turn up on the panel, uh, please drop us a line. That sounds like an excellent idea. I'll be in touch to organise okay. that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Cheryl. Have a great day. Yes. Okay, bye.